I'd like to welcome our viewers on YouTube who are joining us as well, our little congregation out there. And uh, I'd like to say grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I was reading through the Morning Glory paper here and uh, reading an article and uh, then I looked up and I, oh my, Carol Hoikala. The heart, man's most central part. So, Carol, there it is. You've hit the morning glory. That is, uh, that is something. And uh, had a guy call me from North Dakota, uh, way out in Flaxton, North Dakota, Ron Nelson, a wonderful pianist. And he says, does that hoikala go to your church? I read your article. I really liked it. And uh, so anyway, and uh, he wanted to call you, and I gave him your phone number. I hope you don't mind. He wanted to talk to you about that, and he wanted to talk to you about the ministry you do with the prisoners. And uh, so anyway, praise God. Uh, I recently heard about a brand new CEO of a corporation. Uh, the employers, none of them knew this individual. And uh, she uh, was appointed to that position, the head, chief executive officer of a major corporation. And she asked the owner of the company before that she was introduced if she could, for two or three weeks, uh, go incognito, undercover, and be a secretary in the head office. So he said, sure. And uh, she went and applied for the job, and I don't know if he had arranged for her to get it or what, but she got the job as secretary. And my, that was an education for her. Uh, some people treated her very well and respectfully, but many of the department heads treated her very poorly and de in a demeaning way. And uh, not just men. Some of the women uh, leaders in the company treated her very demeaning, and others were very nice. And so she did that for about three weeks, and then finally the day came that the owner of the company put out a memo and said, uh, I've picked the uh, new uh, CEO for my company, and we're going to have a big banquet, and I'll introduce you, uh, formal attire. So everybody came in their formal attire and in their best behavior, and this lady was there, and, and they came in and sneered at her. How does a secretary get to come to something like this? And, and some of the same people, even there that night, you know, where did you get those nice clothes? I suppose you had to borrow them. And, and then they had the grand announcement, and there she came to the front, and he said, I'd like you to meet the new CEO of our corporation, and some of the department heads just started to crumble inside. And he said, not only is she the new CEO, but she's my wife. <laughs> she came into the office and surprisingly didn't fire everybody who was mean to her. She could sort between the people who were redeemable and not. And in fact, one person who was quite harsh with her, got promoted uh, because it, it, it was, and they talked together, and, and uh, it, it, there was a, a lot of potential, but others just quit. They didn't even wait to get fired. And the whole environment of the company changed because she'd gone undercover. Sort of an incarnation story, isn't it? And that leads us into our scripture for today, our gospel lesson from Luke 2, 40 through 52. One of the great mysteries of the incarnation is that Jesus was true God and also true man. He was secretary and CEO at the same time. God placed himself in a very real human body and that would develop in the same manner as human beings. Uh, there was something powerful 
about this because it gives us him sympathy. Uh, he sympathizes with us because of this. In fact, uh, he understands our weaknesses. Uh, we don't condone them, but he understands them. And that's a marvelous thing. Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, and that without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Today we get a glimpse into the physical and intellectual development of the boy Jesus at about age 12. And that's our gospel lesson for today from Luke 2, 40 through 52. And let's look at that together. Um, really the only uh, glimpse we have of Jesus uh, as a young boy. So we better pay good attention to it. Uh, first of all, under spiritual growth, growing strong. Growing strong. A healthy body. Luke 2, 40. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Uh, it's not necessary to be an athlete, to be an effective Christian, unless God wants you to be an effective Christian athlete, right? But it is helpful to treat our bodies well and to feel the best we can. It's helpful. And let's look at three areas of development here we see in the life of Jesus. First of all, physical development. The child grew and became strong. Jesus had a body just like you and I have, even though he was God in human flesh, that didn't change the humanness of his flesh. As a baby he nursed, he had to learn to walk, he had to learn to talk. Uh, he had the same physical desires for food and warmth and affection and other desires, and he had to in order to be our perfect substitute. And he became strong. That means Jesus developed the ability to carry out what God wanted him to do. That's the strength we need. We don't need the same strength that anybody else in this room is going to need, but we do need the strength to do what God wants us to do. Jesus had to walk hundreds of miles in three years, bringing the gospel uh, to the nation of Israel. Um, many people, uh, many of us, have neglected and abused our bodies. I, I ate so many cookies one day a couple weeks ago. I mean, I literally started to shake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my sister brought her boyfriend over, and, and he and I just got to eat cookies. And he'd bring me cookies and go get more cookies. And boy, by the end of that day, I was, I was literally shaking. You know, I mean, some of us abuse our bodies, and, and, uh, and we're unable to carry out our work that God has us to do. And care for our bodies is important, and that's something that's on our minds in the beginning of January, isn't it? And it's a good thing to be concerned about. Secondly, intellectual development. He was filled with wisdom. Now we see here that Jesus developed with sound education from his family, from his local synagogue, from his own personal study. Uh, but it doesn't say he was filled with knowledge. It emphasizes he's filled with wisdom. Now there's a relationship between knowledge and wisdom as we talked about with the kids. You, you got to, wisdom is, I learned this from, on my internship in Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Uh, uh, Art Bredesen, my neighbor, uh, was talking about a Bible study he had with Pastor David Molstry, and David says, now you go home and find out what wisdom is. And Art Bredesen said, I did, and he came back to Bible study next week. And I told Pastor Molstry, wisdom is applied knowledge. That's right from a meat cutter, too. So that's a good practical definition of wisdom from a butch butcher. Uh, wisdom is applied knowledge. He was filled with wisdom. 
And uh, that's a wonderful and important thing, uh, you know, and it's good for us to be asking, how am I in the wisdom department, huh? I mean, we need, we need people on every walk of life who have the wisdom of God. We need it. We're in a generation where we've got so much knowledge that it's just coming out our ears. We're drowning in knowledge. But applying wisdom, applying good knowledge in our lives, that's what is so needed. First Chronicles 12, 32, going through a, genie, a, a record of the uh, census, you know, of Israel. And he talks about the men of Issachar and just this little comment is put in that long list of people. Um, and it's comments on the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs, all their relatives under their command. Boy, aren't we in a time today when we need 200 chiefs who have wisdom and understand what needs to be done. Oh, to elect 200 people to high offices that have the wisdom of God could transform our nation. And we need to be praying for leaders who have wisdom. I don't know about with you, but I want to be that kind of person. I want to be the kind of person who doesn't just get all scared or crazy or have a lot of opinions, but I want to be the kind of person who understands where we're at for my family, the church, our nation, and, and, and be a leader. Be a leader for this time that can lead with wisdom. And, and, and as Solomon found out, where does wisdom come from? We ask God. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who will give without reproach. God wants us to be wise and intellectual development. Then thirdly, spiritual development. The grace of God was upon him. Here we see that Jesus was developing spiritually. He had a powerful relationship with his Father in heaven. We see that as he went out and sought the Lord early in the morning. He understood the will of God for his life. And I've often thought about that. How did Jesus know what the will of God was for his life? Well, we know that the scriptures was powerful in his life. Whatever he did something, he'd say, thus it is written. It is written. It is written. So as he got into the scriptures, the, God, the Father revealed to him, I'm sure, uh, his position. Uh, I, I don't know. Do you suspect Mary and Joseph sat him down and told him what Gabriel told him? Maybe. Uh, and we know that he was tempted. Angels came and ministered to him. And, and we know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah came back uh, in a special transformed form and were talking to Jesus about what he was about to face. And, and these are all ways which God speaks to us on earth in our humanity. And they're ways that God can speak to us too, primarily through his word. Think of Peter and John. Uh, I love this verse in Acts 4.13. You might say, I'm not very educated. You might say, I don't have a high IQ. Or you might say, I grew up, you know, just in the laboring class. What is there for me? Listen to this. This should be an encouragement for all of us. Acts 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note. What, what was the difference? They took note that they had been with Jesus. They took note that they had been with Jesus. You know, some people don't like New Year's resolutions because they have found from personal experience they don't always follow through on them. But I like New Year's resolutions. Uh, I don't think the thing is that a failure in a resolution means that resolutions are bad. you got to take a first step, be it ever so stumbling. Even if you don't you know, do it perfectly, there's an old saying, and I love it, it's about direction, not perfection. 
Some of us think if we can't do it perfectly, we shouldn't do it at all. No, 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 no. It's about direction, not perfection. And a resolution is kind of a setting your direction. And resolution one, take care of my body and mind and spend time with Jesus. And spend time with Jesus. And then secondly, related to it, growing wise, filled with the word of God. Luke 2, 41 through 47 Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Uh, the Lutheran pastor in Teller, Alaska had to get used to living in an Alaskan native village because they had a different custom in that village than we have in our life. Children sleep at whatever house they're at at bedtime. They go over to someone's house and play. It's a little village. It's like a big family. Most people there are. And the Lutheran pastor found out that his kids will sleep at whatever house they are playing. And that's the custom. And if there's anything wrong, people will let you know, but otherwise they won't. So that's kind of like it was here. I, I mean, where's Jesus? Well, he's with somebody. It's the way we do it. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. <coughs> After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. <coughs> Notice here that Jesus had a strong grip on scriptures. Even the temple teachers were amazed at his understanding and his wisdom. One of the most neglected sources of wisdom and understanding for all of us, maybe not all of us, many of us, is the Holy Bible, is the scriptures, preaching, adult Sunday school, there's always extra chairs, personal Bible study. Uh, I like listening more than reading, it's just the way I am, I'm an oral learner. And I found now that there are that there are places on YouTube where you can listen to scripture. Passages, big passages, selective verses, and they have like the ocean in the background. They actually intended to do it while you're sleeping. Just put it on while you're sleeping. And then if you wake up, and there it is. And boy, this morning I started listening to these scriptures with the ocean in the background. And, and, and I... I was going to finish editing my sermon. I never got to it. It was just such a blessing. All these scriptures and promises of God and portion of scripture being read in such a beautiful way. Go out and find them. There's just tons of places now that offer this on YouTube and other sources. And you can just immerse yourself in the word of God and you can feel it impacting your life in such a powerful way. And when you have trifocals, it's getting hard to read anyway. It's just nice to listen. Uh, and it's interesting. There's two parallel passages in the New Testament. Uh, they're so parallel, and I think there's insight in them. I've shared this before. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Filled with the Spirit. Then Colossians 3, 16 and 17 is almost the same with one little difference. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. What was it? The one was be filled with the Spirit and the other one was be filled with the word of God. And... Uh, it's interesting, uh, we're trying to do some January cleaning, and Sharon found a box of cassette tapes that I hadn't listened to for 25 years, and that was going to uh, 
at least go to the barn, if not somewhere else. And I started, well, well then I had to get defensive. There are my tapes. And I took them out and I sorted them and organized them. And I found in there a tape of old Pastor Leonard Mastin. Used to be at St. Paul's Lutheran in downtown Minneapolis. Jewel Agramson's old pastor 70 years ago. Uh, a great Bible teacher. And he was preaching at a Lutheran evangelistic movement conference in Newark, Illinois, probably back in the early 70s. And he read these two passages. And then in his own deep voice and distinctive way, I remember remember him, he'd come to Coon Valley and, and have little Bible conferences. In fact, uh, his father performed my parents' wedding in Coon Valley. He was pastor there, El Elmast. And, and Leonard read these two passages, and he was such a man of memorizing scripture. And he said in his own voice there in Newark, Illinois, a word-filled Christian is a spirit-filled Christian. And a spirit-filled Christian is a word-filled Christian. And then he'd say, I got up at two in the morning and I read my Bible until God filled my heart. <laughs> he'd say, I don't like dead sermons. I like it when the preacher gets filled with the Spirit of God through the Word of God. And he was quite a guy, Leonard Mastin. A Spirit-filled Christian is a Word-filled Christian. A Word-filled Christian is a Spirit-filled Christian. Uh, it's just so important. For the Word of God is living and active, Hebrews 4.12, sharper than any double-edged sword. Resolution number two, get to know the Word of God. Resolution number two, get to know the Word of God. Number one, take care of your body and mind. Get to know, and then finally, embrace God's plan. Growing up, embracing God's plan. Luke 2, 48 through 52. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went to Nazareth and with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Linda, I, I remember Pastor Leroy Nevin preaching a sermon on that very verse. It just, just came to my mind right now. You remember him. He was your pastor, and you know, his daughter was in our class. And I remember him preaching a sermon to our saviors in Westby on that verse. Uh, interesting how something pops to your mind. Uh, God the Father was revealing to Jesus what his life plan was. And I expect it came to him in the same way as us, you know, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God. But Jesus knew the will of God for his life, and he embraced it. He embraced it. And that was not an easy task. You think of the Garden of Gethsemane. If this possibly could pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And we can know the will of God for our lives too. And I think the biggest thing about that, aside from being in the Word, is just being willing. Just being willing. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Nellie Seeley's favorite verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Jesus showed us what the Father's will was, of course, in his life to go to the cross and to pay for our sins. And it's just an important thing for us, too, to be vigilant. God, what's your will for my life? It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be public. Or it doesn't have to be something where you get recognition. Sometimes it's just the simplest things. I find by experience, just take my word for it, that if I mean this prayer, if I go to bed at night and say, Lord, I want you to have your way in my life tomorrow. I really do. I, I just, Lord, no, no matter what it is, I want to be willing. I find when I go to bed that way, the next day is usually filled with amazing divine appointments. Once my heart is just simply willing 
to do the will of God. One of my favorite books of the hundreds of books I have in my library. You know, we're getting old and we're deciding, oh, what are we going to do? We can't leave this all to our children to handle. And I have to deal with my books. Hundreds of them, hundreds of them. That's packed there, the house packed there, the barn is packed. And uh, what am I going to do? But there's one book that I don't ever get rid of. I keep it in front of me. I have to see that title on the shelf because I know it's so important. The Power of a Surrendered Life. That's the mystery. When we surrender to God and say, I give up, that's when things really, really kick in and the will of God comes charging into our lives with great fruit and power and excitement. So resolution number three, embrace uh, my calling from God. Embrace it. And your calling might be to be a mother. Embrace it. It might be to be a nurse. Embrace it as a calling from God. Uh, we have unexplainable days too. This was a very unexplainable day. And I kind of wonder why Mary and Joseph reacted the way they did with Jesus. And do you know what I think happened? I think they just got so busy raising their family that momentarily they forgot about that day when Gabriel the angel came and talked to them. That's what I think. I think they just couldn't figure out where Jesus was because they momentarily forgot what Gabriel the angel told them. And you know, sometimes we can get that way too, can't we? We don't mean to, but we get so tied up with the cares of life we momentarily forget that we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors to bring the gospel to the world. And then we need to be reminded of that. In closing, you know, this, I've used this passage. Today we've talked about the cross, but Jesus is not just our Savior. He is primarily our Savior. But Jesus is also our example. And there's an amazing Christmas hymn that talks about everything about the incarnation of Christ, and including the cross and the atonement. But there's a verse of this hymn that talks about this very scripture passage for today. I'm sure it's from the Episcopalian background, so it's based upon the gospel lesson for today. And that's once in Royal David's city. We didn't sing it this year. It's, we do once in a while. And verse 4 says this. For he is our childhood's pattern. Day by day, like us, he grew. He was little, weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles, like us, he knew. And he feeleth for our sadness. And he shareth in our gladness. Jesus sympathizes with our weakness. Jesus knows. Jesus cares. Jesus is cheering on, so let's look ahead. He's there. Let's look ahead to the end of the race, see him cheering us on, follow his example, believe in his forgiveness, and run 2022 with endurance and gladness, embracing God's will for our lives, even today. Happy New Year. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human comprehension guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.